Hello, my beautiful people. This is Aaron the Pedantic, and today I'm going to be talking about what is the most Appendix N game I have played. Uh, first off, what is Appendix N? Most of you who are watching this video will already know what Appendix N is. It is the, what, when we say that, we're referring to the list of inspirational reading provided by Gary Gygax in the first edition AD&D book, which is in Appendix N. So all of the things on that list are things that he says are crucial to understanding what exactly D&D is. I don't really want to get too much into all of that necessarily. I feel like that deserves its own video on its own. But what instead I wanted to talk about is how I have been reading a lot of Appendix N literature, at least a few. I'm, I'm working my way up. I'm still, still just an amateur compared to some of you learned scholars who have poured through the the text of many an appendix in book. I'm not that I'm not that far yet, but I'm working on it. But from what I've read, what the, the most appendix in game I have played by far is Dungeon Crawl Classics and I'm going to talk about that in this video. Uh runners up that I runner up that I haven't played would be Hyperborea. Uh it seems quite obvious that that game is also incredibly inspired by Appendix in stuff, uh, then you, of course, you have D and D itself, especially AD and D. Obviously, uh, first edition AD and D is going to be heavily inspired by what is written to be what it was inspired by. That should be terribly obvious, but there are some things I'm going to point out in this video that may kind of give me a, a sufficient reason to put DCC ahead of AD and D on that. And I have played AD and D. Just to clarify, I am running one. I'm running an, uh, an AD&D game currently. So without any further ado, why, why, why? So first off is how Dungeon Crawl Classics handles death. For those who don't know, you actually you may have heard about how DCC is such a deadly game. Holy crap, it is so deadly. Well, it's only that deadly if you are playing a zero-level character or if you suffer a critical from something that is incredibly powerful. Otherwise, it's really not that deadly. The thing is, is that death is permanent. There is no resurrection spell. Now, certainly you can point to several books that are on that list, uh, several that I know of even, that are going to include some kind of resurrection in the books. However, a lot of times that is not something that is too terribly prevalent. It is usually... Uh, very difficult to come by and incredibly dangerous. I mean, think of think of the Conan scene, <laughs> you know, which even though that is from the movie, which is not, not exactly 100% off the books, it's still, uh, from what I understand, has <laughs> still has a root in, in the same kind of feeling uh, you know, that it evokes. But you don't really have that that kind of oh you just need to get raised by a cleric <laughs> you know as far as i know maybe that's in one of the books out there for the most part i think that, that is something that is for convenience's sake more than anything else that it exists in a lot of games with this codified mechanic that is sometimes easy to get sometimes not in dungeon crawl classics it is purely not happening and to me that kind of that kind of evokes the feeling more. You know, death is very final in a lot of ways. Well, how does death come about in DCC? Well, if you're a zero level character, which is basically all the commoners and 95% of the population, and I'll get back to that later, then you die by reaching zero HP. It's over. Game over. You're done. For everybody else, it's a little bit more complicated. You don't just typically outright die. Once you get to zero or even lower, then what happens is you are unconscious and it's kind, you're kind of in a state of perpetual Schrodinger's death. You don't know, you either are dead or you aren't dead, depending on when you roll the body over. So what happens is you have a moment of time to bring them back from the clutches of death you know, with proper healing or first aid or that kind of thing. You have to catch them before the amount of rounds pass is equal to their level. And if you don't catch them on time, they still might be alive. So if you can make it to them on time and render healing, then they're okay. So 
that is already leagues ahead in survivability of basic expert and of AD and D by far, especially because there's no, nothing stopping them from getting up and fighting again after that. But if they, you don't get to them in time. If you don't get to them in time, then you have to do a roll the body check, which is a luck check rolled by the player character that is unconscious. If they fail the luck check, then they are dead permanently. Uh, any player worth their salt is going to really try to keep their luck points, their luck stat pretty high, it, it, at least as high as they, they can manage within reason, just for this very reason. Because luck is so pivotal. If you have a, if you're unfortunate enough to have a three luck, then guess what? You have <laughs> only a 15% uh, chance of surviving whenever you're rolled over. So for the love of God, <laughs> keep that luck high if you can. Um, little reliance on massive parties. So this is another thing. My experiences with Dungeon Crawl Classics are that you generally aren't going to have massive parties of player characters and NPCs like you do with AD&D, kind of in particular, BX. I don't recall there being very stringent rules on what exactly you're supposed to do with these hirelings, how they're supposed to function or anything like that. And that's kind of a, a designer's intent. They seem to be very focused on more like world kind of like general advice issues and then very specific stuff on combat and spells. That is, that is the design philosophy that I see in the dungeon crawl classics book. Not really so much on those kinds of procedural things. So what you're left with is, well, how much would the players be inclined to bring that up to try and get a whole bunch of hirelings? There's nothing really stopping them from doing so, and the uh, judge is going to have every opportunity to adjudicate that however as needed. I would recommend highly just you know pulling from AD&D or BX or whatever, whatever your favorite edition of D&D is if you want to bring in those kinds of hireling rules because you're using the same stats anyway, roughly. But... There isn't, there isn't the same desire to, from what I've noticed. There tends to be less of a desire because of the fact that the, the party members are a lot more self-sufficient in Dungeon Crawl Classics than they are in your standard fair D&D, &D, uh, excluding 5th edition. I have to exclude 5th edition, probably 4th, maybe 3rd. I, I haven't played 3rd. I haven't played 4th. Uh, so I can say that at least in... AD&D and, and BX, my experience has been that as, uh, pretty much as soon as you can you can hire hirelings, you're going to be using them because, like I said before, death comes so swift. Uh, in this, death comes swift unless you have a level behind you. And then it's, you know, it's, it's still coming, maybe. But the higher up you get, it becomes a lot less likely that you're going to die permanently. So... Less reliance on massive parties. To me, whenever I've read uh, the, the things that I've read so far uh, include Fafford and Gray Mauser. They don't really they have the duo going. They don't really have like big groups of people. Uh, so you do have the Hobbit. A uh, Hobbit is going to be one that's going to include the big groups of people. You got me. OK, that one. That one is there. Uh, but whenever we're looking at uh uh, three hearts and three lions. You have maybe uh, I think it's like four people in a group. Typically, you don't you don't, you just don't have these sweeping. You know, I've got like seven player characters, and they have up to you know three hirelings each, etc. You just don't really get that so much. Maybe there is an appendix in book that does that. I just haven't encountered it yet. But for that reason, I tend to get more of the vibe from DCC. Okay, alignment. So. D&D has always had alignment, but in my personal opinion, Dungeon Crawl Classics implements alignment in a way that I think is best. Now, how does it do that? Well, first off, it uses the law, neutrality, chaotic uh, alignment. It doesn't really delve into good and evil and all that kind of stuff, just because that's not really something we need to get into, guys. We don't, we don't really need that. Uh, do I condemn that in AD&D? No, I don't condemn it. It's fine. But at the same time, I, the reason that I kind of point out that this is something interesting that, that 
is particularly appendix in is because whenever I was talking about three hearts and three lions before, good and evil is kind of something that is perhaps assumed with <clears throat> the axis of law and chaos, but it's not really something that you you need to draw out necessarily. You have you have civilization and order and humanity versus uh, you have kind of evil, chaotic weirdness. Uh, strange behaviors, you, demons and devils and elves, oh my, that kind of thing. Well, not only do you have that spread, because that alone isn't really enough to do it, but what alignment you choose also has pretty severe uh, consequences beyond the kind of stuff that you get in D&D usually. So uh, an example, uh, your who you can heal is going to be affected by what alignment they are because your deity is not going to want to render aid to those that are of an opposing alignment. It makes it more difficult for you to heal them and it can tick off that deity. Uh, whenever we're talking about what kinds of things can you turn, uh, and this is the turning unholy is something that feels very three hearts and three lions. For those who don't know, there's a scene in three hearts. Actually, it happens a few times where the protagonist is using, he uses his cross and he says the holy names, you know, the holy uh, Mary and Joseph and all that kind of stuff. He says it in his Latin and all that. And the, they, 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 ah, you know, they, they kind of, they kind of shirk away. And the way that that, the way that that plays out, of course, they have that in D&D, &D, but what the thing that makes it particularly alignment oriented, which I really appreciate, is the way that it is going to decide who is repelled by your turn unholy based off of alignment. So if you are someone of neutral alignment, for instance, then you aren't really turning the same people as you would if you were lawful. You're going to be turning... Uh, it kind of there's kind of some generic categories, but monsters and there's all, there's all kinds of stuff in there. It's very specific to that alignment. I find that I find that fascinating. I also find that it, it engages the alignment principle in a way that I think is a lot deeper. Um, the rarity of class characters in the world. So this is something that I I picked up on, you know, when I was running, uh, re reading, researching for my Greyhawk game. Uh, was that in the modules, in the material, the gazette here, and all this kind of stuff, there are a ton of people out there in the world of Orth, uh, that is the, um, you know, the, the Greyhawk world, who have classes and levels. This is not so in Dungeon Crawl Classics. It is just not so, especially to the same levels that we're talking about, where you have people running around that are eighth level, ninth level, and it's not just the level scale because you go beyond 10th level in uh, your, your AD and D game. But when it comes to dungeon crawl classics, it has some guidance explicitly. What does your world look like as far as, you know, the spreading of the classes and all that kind of stuff? Well, it says 95% of the population have no class at all. And that's not a diss. That is saying that they are not a warrior, a, uh, I was about to say magic user, but wizard, any of those kinds of things. Instead, they are just basic ass peasants. So even your soldiers, uh, who are probably going to make up a pretty decent chunk of the population, especially, okay, there's going to be a lot of peasants. It's there's, there's some wiggle room there, but not all soldiers are going to be level one warriors is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so even out of that 5% remaining, most of them are only first level. So you have some very few second level, and then it goes up to the point where the 10th level character is something that is like once in a millennium kind of thing. They are so incredibly rare. That's the occurrence of somebody that gets that high level. So that just tells you what kind of world you're dealing with and the amount of proficiency that even a level one character has. This is why some people say DCC is incredibly gonzo. It's hard to work with and all this kind of stuff. You just kind of have to accept that as far as your player characters go, they are a big deal. Once they, once they get to first level, they are a pretty big deal and they only become bigger deals as they go along. 
So uh, what does that point out to? Uh, that points out to the Warriors being really, really, really cool. So one of the things that they can do is this thing called Mighty Deeds of Arms. And Mighty Deeds of Arms, to me, is an incredibly appendix in concept, It is especially in its execution, especially in its execution. Because what it is, is, you know, instead of just having, do I hit? Yes, I hit. Here's my damage. Move on. Uh, which there's nothing wrong with that. It is perfectly functional. But is it appendix N? Not really. It is really just a means for us to handle this complex procedure of, does this person kill this person? Uh, and all that kind of stuff. This, whenever you get to Mighty Deeds of Arms, you're getting into the cool stuff, the pulpy things. And if you read the Appendix in books, they're, for the most for the most part, very pulp fantasy novels. Stuff is just happening constantly. Stuff keeps moving and moving and moving. And, you know, dramatic moments are going to happen. Cool stuff is done by your protagonists and uh, by your villains as well. Whenever you do have villains uh, that are on the page, they're going to be doing very interesting stuff. So because of that, the fact that my warrior, even at level one, has a 33% chance if I hit on my attack to do something really cool, like, you know, disarm my opponent, uh, stagger them, uh, you know, distract them, do some kind of some kind of extra thing is really, really awesome. And it only gets better as they become more powerful Then, then it might be, well, not only did I disarm them, I actually like cut their arm open. <laughs> So now they're bleeding profusely and they're going to have a penalty to their attack for so many rounds or whatever. That is something that could happen with your mighty deeds if you roll high enough on your deed die. It is just pure pulp action stuff and it is awesome. It's also very, very easy to adjudicate and it happens very quickly. So next you have the magic. So the magic... Magic is incredibly powerful and incredibly dangerous. If you get two wizards in a room and they're mad at each other, everybody should back up a lot. <laughs> and if that wasn't bad enough, just by the fact that you never really know if they're going to miscast and have, you know, some kind of disastrous effect happen on themselves, then you are going to potentially have the, the, the energies of these two magical things coming together in ha having this strange effect, you know, the, the phlogiston disturbance is the kind of thing that can go off. And what, what this makes me think of, the way that it has its, its wizardy duels uh, is something that you can do, which I know some people don't like the rules for it, but I, I, I think they work. They're clunky, but they work and they're really cool. The, the, what ends up what it ends up looking like is it ends up looking like a lot of things that I have seen so far in my readings. Uh, so for instance, this, this whole concept that magic is this deadly unpredictable force. is just how often these things can, uh, can really decide the decided outcome very quickly. And this is something that AD and D does as well. For the most part, it's something that has been stifled a little bit uh, over the years. You know, these control effects, especially, oh my gosh, the control effects, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the moment in, uh, the story about the, the guy who, mm, okay. It's in one of Vance's novels. And for the moment, I'm having a hard time thinking of which one it is. It's the guy who had a uh, curse was cursed with a very ugly face. And a spell was cast on him and his associate, but the problem was that his associate, uh, Sace, uh, I, I don't even know if that's the way to pronounce it, uh, was wearing an amulet that reflects charms. <laughs> and so this charm that is meant to force someone to do whatever you tell them is reflected back onto the caster. And then there is this very clever exchange where the, the caster is trying to make the most use out of that and help her friend who is also stuck under the influence of it. You know, these are, is that something you can replicate with D&D? Yes, but it is something that it, it is evoked with Dungeon Crawl Classics very easily just by the way that it is done. Um, I still have a lot of reading to do as far as more ways that magic is used in a lot of the other worlds. Uh, Vancean magic, of course, is mathematical. So it's, it is very predictable. It's just that it's very potent. And magicians, for that reason, are widely feared. And 
that is definitely no no exception in Dungeon Crawl Classics. The uh, only big exception here is that they often end up looking like degenerate scumbags because of the way that their magic is potentially going to disfigure them. So uh, that is another thing. I would love to hear more takes about the magic stuff because honestly, that's one that I, I feel like I could probably use to learn some more on. Um, but we'll we'll go into that some other time. So how criticals and fumbles introduce dramatic outcomes in tension. This is another thing kind of playing into the way that Mighty Deeds of Arms is this very pulpy kind of thing. Rather than just concerning yourself with hit or miss, and the other procedures that fall, yeah, you know, standard procedures that fall within combat. Instead, you also have to worry about criticals and fumbles. And it's not just you do extra damage or your weapon breaks. That's not you know, how criticals and fumbles work. You have actual charts in here that at times the charts can be kind of weird and you have to make sense of them. Whenever you're rolling a critical for a... Uh, a projectile weapon and you're using a blunt weapon, but it says that it uh, chops off something, <laughs> then obviously you're going to have to come up with some kind of something else, something else, but it, on par with, with the same level of, of severity, but matches the weapon type that you're using. So sometimes it requires some adjudication, but the important thing is that instead of it just being a matter of HP damage and that kind of thing, instead of that, you are dealing with some incredible stuff that can happen. Like I said, limbs chopped off, heads chopped off, uh, blows causing brain damage, uh, broken arms, broken legs, um, you know, uh, toes, <laughs> you know, being cut off. You, the, the things are endless. They're, they're, well, they're not endless. They have an end. They have a very finite <laughs> ending, but there are so many different uh, things that can come and they all are based off of what class and level you are, which basically makes things even more interesting from the aspect of I'm playing this class. Oh, I rolled, I rolled a critical. So what does that mean? It's going to have a lot more interesting things and it makes it so that the warrior becomes a death machine because they roll criticals more often. They also are going to have uh, more severe criticals. Like I said, um, for instance, I had a level six or seven warrior who instantly decapitated a high level wizard because rolled a critical, rolled like a 30 on the critical chart. So that's just how it played out. That is the kind of thing that can happen. But for everybody else, what about your fumbles? Because fumbles are going to happen pretty frequently. <laughs> they, have, they happen pretty regularly. Uh, and when they do happen, a fumble is going to be sometimes funny. Sometimes funny, but it can be explained away instead of being the fault of how stupid the player is, which a lot of times people play off, well, your player character is just a klutz and they fall over. Instead of that, it could be, no, the person that they're engaged in battle with is act actually took advantage of a particular moment and shoved them to the ground or whatever it is, whatever the fumble was. You know, it's not that you're just a wacky, a wacky person who spins around and falls over in this comical nature. No, it's this very dramatic moment where you happen to, you take a risk, it doesn't go through, the enemy seizes that, the opportunity and then puts you at a disadvantage and that's your fumble. And with this, with this something just happening uh, every so often, it adds more tension. I've had player characters stuck on their back <laughs> because they are, they have to perform a reflex roll before they can get back up. Now, again, again, does it make it, it makes them sound, oh, that's funny. They're like a turtle on their back. Ha ha. Well, there are reasons that you could perhaps excuse that. Is there nobody else around? Then maybe you just let them get up. If there is somebody else around, then maybe that, that reflex check is them not only dodging these blows, but also finding an opportunity to get up without being harmed. Okay. Uh, the final note that I really wanted to touch on is supplements and adventures. So one of the biggest things that I can point to uh, is stuff like this dungeons, uh, dungeon crawl classics, Lankmar, which is made is, is a whole ass expansion to the game made explicitly for the purpose of making your games just like Fritz and Lieber's, uh, Fr Fritz, Lieber's, Fritz and Lieber's. <laughs> I was combining Fritz Lieber with uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser uh, with, with their, their escapades in Lankmar. 
So that is the kind of thing that you can you can get into. And not only do they have that, they also have Empire of the East, which is by another Appendixin author. They are working on Goodman Games. Uh, Goodman Games is working on Tales of the Dying Earth, which the Dying Earth DCC books uh, should be coming out in the near future, I would imagine, sometime soon. But not only do they have all of these supplements, which, by the way, the Lankmar one, I have not yet played, but I have read. And it does an excellent job of taking the, the core rules of Dungeon Crawl Classics and then shifting them into what is most appropriate for uh, the world of Fafford and the Grey Mauser in order to really replicate those kinds of adventures. Not really, you know pulling over all this other stuff no they get rid of they get rid of clerics instead you've got fighters thieves and wizards uh they change the way that magic works it's not quite this you don't have the mercurial magic you don't have kind of the wacky stuff uh, as you have before uh instead you have more ritualistic magic and uh for that reason it, it's it's just it feels different uh the way that the occupations are they are built into the world in a way that that you have basically nationalities built into your character uh histories and just all kinds of stuff it is very very cool uh empire of the east i haven't read that one yet but if they can if you if they continue that trend then it is it is it is an incredible way to pull in very specific appendix and book uh, inspiration, well, not even inspiration, just translations into tabletop. It's, it's, it's just, it's awesome. I just, I, I love it. I mean, I, I'm going to sound like a shill at this point, but, uh, even without the supplements, we also have a lot of adventures that, that evoke a lot of appendix in stuff. So for instance, uh, you have, um, oh gosh, Michael, uh, somebody's going to tell me his name. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to feel bad for forgetting it. Oh, wow. Michael, 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 Michael. Uh, the guy, okay, the guy who wrote The Queen of Elfland's Son. Okay. Uh, that module in particular is, uh, as I'm sure that y'all can tell by the name, it has very, very strong vibes with a, an Appendix N book. There's just a ton of Appendix N stuff. It's just it's built in there, of course. Dungeon Crawl Classics, it has it. Uh, I'd love to hear more reasons from those of you who maybe you know more of appendix in books than i do you people could say aaron you have no business talking about this because you are not you're not a learned scholar of uh of appendix in how dare you even touch this subject i'm inspired by it somebody asked me the question and I, these are these are the reasons that came to mind when i thought why is dungeon crawl classic so appendix in to me so that really covers, for the most part, all of that kind of stuff. I'm curious what y'all have to say. This has been a lot longer than I anticipated, but uh, there was a lot to say. There's just a lot to cover here and then a lot of rambling, unfortunately, and I'm sorry about that. Um, tell me what you think. Uh, what is the most Appendix N book to you? Not book, game game to you that you have played. What makes it so? What are the things that make uh magic very appendix n e let's hear what you have to say uh especially those of you who know more than i i would love to hear it uh those of you that have any uh suggestions for topics that i should discuss in further videos lay them on me i'd be more than happy to get into it uh that's it for today y'all take it easy <laughs>